This is The Change Physician, episode 165. Hey folks, welcome back to another episode of The Change Physician. This is your host, Dr. Kevin Kukara, with my Amazeballs co-host, Dr. Melissa Cady, and a very special guest. This is Dr. Naveen Goyal. Dr. Goyal is an anesthesiologist who uh, trained at a fantastic institution, the University <laughs> of Chicago. No bias is there at all. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit more. He's got an amazing journey. Uh, I, I just have to start this out. This is sort of a cheat episode. So when I was at University of Chicago, again, no bias, you know, it was an amazing institution, just what happened to be, we just happened to train there. Uh, Naveen was a year under me when I was a CA2, he was a CA1, when I was a CA3, he was a CA2. His class was awesome. Naveen was awesome. Really, really enjoyed him. Always had, we just had great experiences. Always like being on call with you. Always felt good having you on my team. Um, and then as you happens, you leave and you go off into the real world. And all of a sudden I started seeing his name pop up. And I was like, is that Naveen? And I looked at your picture. I'm like, that is Naveen. And he was not doing anesthesia at the, w- w- with some of the pictures I was seeing. In fact, it had um, the video I happened to see was in Chicago. And I think the Chicago Bulls were involved. A lot of really non-medical stuff. We will get into that in a bit. But I was very excited to reconnect with him. And for this episode, we're going to talk about Dr. Goyal's physician journey, why he went into medicine, why he chose anesthesia. And then uh, for episode two, we'll talk about what he's doing now, which is the other exciting things that he's kind of jumped off of and kind of leveraged his medical knowledge into new fields. So Naveen, great to have you on the show. Thank you for having me. It's great to be on the show with someone who I used to ask advice for. (laughs) (laughs) Well, it, it is an absolute treat. And so just to kind of get started here. Why is it that you chose to go into medicine? Like, what was the the journey that you had that kind of led you to this path? Sure. Um, I like to start with, uh, I'm an Indian American guy here. So it's not unusual in the Indian community to say, are you going to go into medicine or potentially engineering? (laughs) Or if you have a business already in the family, are you going to run the business? And so that was not uncommon in our household conversation. Uh, But I do remember from a very young age that I liked science. Medicine didn't scare me off. Sometimes people say, I definitely don't want to do it. I think when I thought about it, I liked science. I was pretty simple and focused back then. So I was like, let me just get good grades because that's what my parents care about. That's literally what mattered. It wasn't athletics, which is important, but definitely wasn't emphasized. It was get good grades and things will go well for you. And so I think it was the challenge of getting into a competitive field. Of course, we had some physicians as um, family friends. My parents' friends were, you know, physicians, and I thought they were always very intelligent. They always seemed to have this glow or something. And maybe it was because my parents were like, oh, he's a, he's a physician here. She's a physician. You should talk to them. Um, but they just seemed intelligent. They obviously helped people, and they cared for people. All those kind of things were influential in me going into medicine. So after um, undergrad, then you're, you're tracking into medicine. Did, was your expectations of medical school then met, or did you find it different than what you were anticipating? Yeah. So I went to Ohio State um, in undergrad, and I got into medical school, University of Cincinnati, uh, which was great. I, I like to tell people that it wasn't easy for me to get in. I got waitlisted a few schools and I ended up getting into Cincinnati, which is where I wanted to go. So I already started out with this, hmm, I got in, but am I really as smart as everyone around me? Which proved uh, to be correct in my thoughts where there was a lot of very smart people around me and that was intimidating. Um, So medical school was challenging. I met really good people. We were studying our tails off. uh, So you get close with that bond. Um, I think it does help when people are going through their own challenges together at a table. Um, But I found it very interesting. I I think in retrospect, I wasn't as mature as others in all seriousness. I just, you know, was, was focused on the social, like let's, let's study and get through this. So the weekend we can go out. And I was single at the time. I was a little less mature maybe. And um, you know, that's what I remember about it in the early years of medical school. Uh, And, and that was, it was challenging, but then I think when third year hit, which was our clinical rotation, that's when I started getting the groove. That's where I think a little more social skills, a little more thinking on your feet. I think that's where my skill sets were a little bit stronger versus studying the books. 
So I really enjoyed the clinical rotations. Uh, I felt privileged and grateful to be in that position because I know how smart people around me were and how much there was to learn. Um, so, you know, I, I don't know if that answers your question, but I, I enjoyed it. It was very challenging, um, but you have to be committed. Yeah. And, and I think that comes up quite a bit. It is a challenge. And there's some people, um, I, I think have a different expectation when they go to medical school that maybe it's, it's more of a hurdle. Your experience sounds kind of similar to mine, except for a little bit reversed as I went in there. There's a lot of smart people. Um, I enjoyed the studying part. I actually had a harder time during the clinical rotations, but I can't ever remember, you know, that, Oh, I don't, I don't, am I in the right place? Kind of thing, you know, that yeah. and some, and some people experience that, but when we go into what I always find it interesting is anesthesia, you know, anesthesia tends to not be a core rotation. So what led you to go into anesthesia and why ultimately did you pursue that residency? Yeah, I got lucky because we had two elective rotations that we could do in our third year. And my elective rotation was early in my third year. Mm -hmm. And a person I knew, he was um, a year ahead of me in medical school. He was going into anesthesiology. He's already uh, applying for residencies and knowing my personality, knowing that I liked physiology and pharmacology. Those are two subjects that I was kind of going, uh, I kind of embraced. Uh, it was challenging once again, but I, I really enjoyed studying it more than others. Um, he said, you should try anesthesia. You, I think, would like it based on your personality. And I said, I've never even thought about it. I don't even know about this field. Um, this is also, I think, before a big, you know, chunk of classes were going into anesthesia. I think it was in the, in the beginning of that. Mm -hmm. And so I took the rotation, or I should say I started the rotation, and I had an incredible attending or let's say mentor who took me under his wing and once again was but five times as smart as I was and was just grilling me and stimulating me intellectually while we were doing procedures. So I was like, wow, this is challenging, but you're using your hands while you're thinking and you need to be efficient. You need to be, you know, go from here to here. And I actually like efficiency. I'm a very efficient robotic kind of person. Get up, make my bed, go run, work out, do this. So I'm like, you know, I appreciate that. So I fell in love with the rotation very early on. And I was pretty much when I was doing my rotation, I said, I'm going to compare this to everything, but I'm pretty sure I want to do this. So I was fortunate enough to know what I wanted to do. Yeah. Those, those things that you just mentioned there, like this, a sense of like efficiency. I like to do this yeah. and that. Were you thinking that back then? Or do you look in retrospect and think that's probably why I was drawn to it? I'm just curious. Actually, yeah, no, it's a great question. There's a, a couple more details I want to add into it. I did remember uh, that that moving quick, like a little bit of pressure on time. I observed that and I liked it. I didn't know that I liked it so much, but I was definitely drawn to it. And then the other thing, which sounds a little superficial, but this is this is being real here, is my mentor. He was intelligent and he was fit. Mm. He committed to fitness. So he had <laughs> time for fitness. And so he would work out either before or after, but that he was incorporating that into his uh, life along being fulfilled. And I'll tell you through medical school, we didn't talk about this, but that, that was a big part of me getting through. I would break in some of my 14 hour days, go to the gym, you know, let off some steam, but I felt good. And I was always into fitness and nutrition. So those were, you know, those kind of things painted a picture for me. Yeah. That's interesting because I felt like being active. I mean, I kept my, it dealt with the anxiety or tension of yep. dealing with the studying and, and school. But it's interesting how there's so much serendipity sometimes with who you get matched up with yes. for a mentor and how they influence, because you obviously haven't experienced everything. And I, I always find that fascinating because um, you hear these stories from medical students. They decide who, what field they want to go into because they met a really cool person <laughs> yeah. that aligned with their values or what they want to be like when they, you know, they get older, but is there any other field that semi interested you aside from anesthesia? Maybe because the mentor was so great. Um, there is nothing that stands out there. Are, <laughs> it, and, and mentor wise, there was a family practitioner who was incredible and I learned a ton from, but the, the roll into each room and, and, and the reset, uh, I just kind of knew that this is not what I wanted to be, but I thoroughly enjoyed, I would have probably enjoyed surgery more, but the culture, well, the culture of surgery in general is antiquated and, and harsh, 
at Cincinnati, it was, it made a lot of people cry and, and like panic attacks. And it was horrible. Even for me, uh, it was, it really pushed me to my limit. So I, I feel like I didn't get a good shot at that field, but I really think a lot of, and there's a lot of fields like that, that are kind of toxic and push you and drive you. You don't even get to really appreciate it. So um, yeah, anesthesia very early on. And that's why I got exposed to it and I'm fortunate enough to get exposed to it. And I liked it right away. Um, so there, there was plenty of people that I feel like I influenced a little bit by the end of their third year. They're like, I still don't know what I want. Why do you like anesthesia so much? And I said, boom, 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 you know? <laughs> so <laughs> that, that makes me laugh because um, that was very similar to my experience too. Like I, I remember I had all this big plan for my third year and da, 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 and, and ended up, I, I don't remember how they do it, like a draw or whatever. It was completely reversed. My plan was, comp- was blown out of the water. I ended up doing my surgical uh, rotations in my second, my third month, which in, I wanted it at the end. And then just happened to fall on anesthesia. And I was like, holy crap, this is amazing. I just loved it. And from Melissa's point, like that thing, you know, looking back, it's like, was it because I hated internal medicine so much? And then I did anesthesia right after, like, did that influence me? But I, but the social environment, because I, I know you, Naveen, you're always, you're, you're a wonderful person to talk to. You're a fun person to be around. And so many people think that anesthesia is not social. And I was like you, I walked into it. It was like, it was like a, it was like a dance, right? You know, you're involved with all these people. You're, you're seeing, seeing, seeing the patient and you have to have this rapport real quickly. And then you're working in this really dynamic environment. Um, did you, did you also find that kind of social dynamic, which I think a lot of people don't assume about anesthesia, but that social environment in the, in, in the operating room is attractive as well. I did, you know, it's walking into the room. It's, it's seeing nurses and staff and assistants and it's coordinating everything towards the patient. Hey, let's do this. And you're always, you know, getting or giving direction with people. And so outside of the actual case, when things of course can be boring and mundane, um, there is a lot of people coordination and social uh, culture wise in the operating room and, and perioperative area. So yes, I definitely noticed that. And that's where I get energy from. And you know, we'll be talking about that more a little later. <laughs> so you, you tracked into to anesthesia and then was there ever a moment in, that where, you, where you were doing anesthesia and going, well, this wasn't the, the I'm in the wrong, wrong place or did I make the right choice or this is more stressful than I realized or, or anything like that? So I'll give you a, a, a funny answer here that um, recently I spoke with another um, resident I trained with. Um, and she told me, Naveen, when I met you in residency, you're the first and only person to this day that told me I am so passionate about anesthesia. <laughs> Who the heck talks like that? I don't remember that, but it's definitely something I would have said. And that, that was, you know, that, that was my four years in residency. It was going in. I, number one, I was extremely grateful to be at a place like the University of Chicago. Once again, imposter syndrome. I am the least smartest here. There are very smart medical students, staff, co-residents around me. I was intimidated. I mean, I turned that intimidation into interest and fuel, but um, in the end, I was just happy to be there. And so even on the the long hours and some of the crazy calls, I was like, this is, I am learning so much right now. And that was my four years. Um, You know, I, I, I was social. I was, I was having a good time, but I was actually just feeling really good. So I had no regrets and I felt even more strongly about my future. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, so how long did you, did you go into private practice? I I didn't hear like, how did that transition? Yeah. So I I like to say this openly too. I think we had 18 people in our residency class and our chairman of our department was also, I believe, president of the ASA at the time, or, you know, politically just, you know, a big wig. Mm -hmm. And I remember specifically him telling us, you, you know, really should do a fellowship. We highly encourage you to do a fellowship to maintain your niche and your expertise in this silo for employment, for long-term and all these things. And myself and one other person were the only two in our class that did not do a fellowship. Mm. And by then, again, all my passion and all this good stuff, I was like, I'm ready to roll. Like, I know what I know. 
I actually felt very prepared. There was a little bit of typical academic centers where sometimes I feel like they scare you and like, are you sure you're ready? Don't you want to do this here in cardiac anesthesia? And I was like, no, not at all. I'm good. Like I, I, I learned everything you wanted me to. I felt really good. Not, not, you know, overconfident, but just confident. So I'm ready to work. I'm ready to earn money and be out of train. Mm -hmm. So I went and got a awesome job in Columbus, uh, Columbus, Ohio, where I grew up and where I had family and I got a great private practice job. I still think it's, uh, it's an incredible group of people from different programs uh, in a thousand bed hospital doing from cardiac to all these other things. So it was a, it was a nice variety of cases and a good group of people. And, and I got a job. And once again, I was just grateful to get it. Hmm. So how long there? I ended up working there a total of 13 years. Oh, wow. So, yeah, I became partner after two years, at the traditional track. And uh, I ended up becoming medical director for one of our hospitals for seven years. Uh, and through that journey, I learned, um, you know, leadership skills, um, not being liked by a group of people, even though that was my play is like, Hey, I like to make sure people like me and know that I'm doing well, but just like the real world anywhere, there's a, in a large group, you have different opinions and people question your intentions. Um, and, but I grew up, you know, I really grew up and learned a lot. It wasn't easy. I can say it so confidently and, and smiling right now, but it was challenging times, but it made me grow up. Um, and I also learned a lot from administration, what administration does, how much they know, what physicians play a role in, what they don't play a role in. Um, so I, I, I got a good, you know, uh, a lot of experiences from that. Last thing. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I want to explore this a little bit more though, because, yeah. um, because you just kind of went, Oh, nonchalant. Oh, I became medical director and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> what was the decision making there? I mean, cause you're now, you, you are now coming out. You, you know, residency is tough. Everybody's like, oh, okay, I want to make money. You're in your, your, your niche. Why then did you decide to pick up more responsibility now into something that was not necessarily directly related to anesthesia. So what was the decision-making for you to pursue becoming medical director? When I joined the group, I had a mentor there, like many, many folks. He was a, a few years into the group um, and was in some leadership positions. And when I joined, he pretty much said, I can tell you're a hard worker. You seem to, to be good socially. I think you're going to do really well in this group. And we just got close. We became friends. And he ended up becoming medical director of one of the hospitals in our group. And basically, I became his confidant of this is what's going on. This is the friction that I'm dealing with. Gosh, you know, am I doing this right and not? And so I kind of became, I was like under his wing. So I was being groomed, but I didn't know. <laughs> and basically he ended up headbutting so hard with some other folks in my group that he left, which still is in the front pages somewhere of a newspaper that doesn't exist, but it was a big deal to leave my group because it's, it's a, it's a, you know, blow to the ego. Like we are the group, but you know, we, we, we did a lot of great things, but, he left and he needed to do what he needed to do and left for another group in town. And he basically said, Naveen, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to leave in the, in a, in a correct manner, but I really want you to take this position over. It's going to do, it's going to be good for the group, but it's also going to be good for what I've been working on over the years at this hospital. So a very, very long answer to what you asked is I, you know, essentially got thrown into this position. I did not raise my hand and say, yeah, let's do it. It's, it's time for me. I was actually nervous. I was anxious and I was questioning myself like, oh man, this guy who was leaving, who was my mentor was not liked by half the group because it was just being in this position of medical director for this specific hospital. It was just creating a lot of friction. And I knew right away that I was not going to be liked by a third of the group. Imagine that for a person who usually under the radar, what's up, let's grab a coffee you know, um, try to rely on me. I'm a good person suddenly to like, wait, you're representing what you're representing, you know, a culture clash and stuff like that. So that's how I started that position. So why do you say yes? I said yes, 
because he was my mentor and he basically looked at me and said, Naveen, you know, you should be doing this. And I was working a lot at that hospital and I was there a lot and I did know it, you know, it's almost, so I just realized that it was, it was my own, I didn't, this is not the perfect time. And then you realize there's no perfect time in life, but I did know that I could have fulfilled, you know, filled his shoes in pretty well. So it was like, I'm a partner. I want what's best for this group. Me doing this is probably the smoothest transition right now. Mm-hmm. So it was like a responsibility thing and it was a capability thing. I got that, but I was still anxious about it. Yeah. So it sounds like you believed in you before you believed in yourself. Yes. And that's, that's what I like telling people, the power of mentorship. Sometimes that has to happen. Other people need to believe in you before you can believe in yourself. And it's just giving a little bit of time. So uh, it's, it's spot on. Yeah. So what did you find that was the biggest lesson that you learned the role of a medical director? Like if you were to put it in a sentence, what would, what would that be? The biggest lesson I learned is that as long as you know your intention is good and you're going to work really hard, and if there's disappointment around you, don't question that you're doing the wrong thing. You're always going to be making decisions that appease some and disappoint others. But as long as you can sleep well at night, knowing you intend to do good and you are working hard, you're not slacking off, especially in a private practice. Those two things at the core is what eventually turned into caring of what every person did to caring about what is right for the group. And sometimes other people don't know what's right for the group because they have not been in that position. And so I think that, again, is a early um, realization for in a leadership position. You just need to be comfortable with that. Yeah, you almost took it from you worrying about the patient doing the right thing for them, no matter what other people think, to take it to a more global level with the group. Exactly right. That's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's kind of interesting to me as well because um, these these reflections of leadership and particularly with administration and physicians in general have a lot of conflict with mis- administration and there's a lot of um, things that are often said about physician administrators you know sell out or whatever <laughs> it, and but what I what, what's interesting with you is there's a difference between if if you were groomed or you had someone say hey I really want you to do this but there was a part of you that sounded like you know I think this is the right thing to do but you weren't doing it necessarily for ego intentions. And then it seems to be reflected through that, you know, through the, through, through your performance as well. Cause I'm, I'm hearing you again. I, I, I did this cause this is the right thing for the group. I did this because this is what we needed to do. I didn't hear anything about, well, I did it because I, I wanted to step my career up in some way, or I, I, you know, and I, 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 would you encourage then for other physicians who perhaps are like, I have no interest in administration. Me personally, I'm like, well, if you have no interest in that, you probably need to be in it because those are the people that we need her doing it because it's the right thing to do rather than um, they want the, the check mark on their CV and climb up the, into the CEO position of the hospital or something. Yeah, I highly encourage people to take these roles just to learn and experience. And so everyone has an opinion, right? So a person who has no interest in their resume or climbing the ladder or being or working more still has an opinion and they'll say, gosh, I can't believe our group did this. Well, do you know the discussions that happen um, that determine that decision that eventually get communicated to you? And if you've never been in that room, you should be in that room. You should try it, you know? And so I encourage everybody. And I like to talk about this exact story about me becoming medical director and how much I learned, how much I learned about myself and how much stronger I got that applied to so many other things in my life. And I think everyone should do that because in the end, it's the whole journey of learning. And when you're in private practice as an anesthesiologist, specifically in my group, after three, four years, your learning curve is like much less. You're now comfortable. And so outside of medicine, maybe you're learning other things, but within medicine, it's probably good to know how decisions are being made that definitely affect your opinions. Mm. Yeah, that's a good point as far as the learning curve. <laughs> you get a little complacent at times when it's the same huh. thing and it's yeah, day you, in and day out. You want to be bored in medicine, but the problem is you're bored in medicine. <laughs> right? It's like you 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 want to be done with school to stop learning, and but then you stop learning. <laughs> right. 
I know you're the smartest the first day after you take your you know board exam and and then it's like teeters like it's being able teeters. To- <laughs> yeah but it teeters and then you start, you're bo- you're not studying for a test you're not reading stuff or whatever so you're like what do I do they're like what do I do and so you can really be a bum and just not learn much else or you can continue being a sponge and just continue doing what you've been doing which is just learning so much information yeah no I can see that. Go ahead, Kevin. Yeah. So while you're in this position now where you're, you're practicing anesthesia full time and you're a medical director, what what was what were some key takeaways that you wish you had known when you started? You know, if I had known then what I know now, this is what I would have done differently. Is there anything else that you would have done differently or wish if you were grooming somebody, what would you how would you prepare a physician to go into more of an administrative role? Yeah. So I, I would say, what are, what are your long-term goals? And some people um, want to eventually work in administration or see themselves as shifting clinically into some admin, right? Which, which is not uncommon, I feel, I feel like. So getting exposure to administration to actually know what's going on. Because we just, you know, a person who's never dealt too much with administration or worked with them, we just hear you know, from the outside, there's a lot of administration, there's more administration than there are clinical people in the hospital. Well, why don't you learn about it yourself versus just reading about it? So that's good exposure. Um, So I definitely encourage that those steps to take. I also would encourage what we're talking about right now is you will get bored in your career in medicine. And and most people will get to some level of boredom. And all I'm saying is I've never heard that statement. When I was going into medicine, no one ever told me that. And there's nothing wrong here. It's just about being real. So by the way, prepare yourself as you get more comfortable, as you become in, you know, get into a routine, you're going to start getting bored. I suggest you continue learning about different things to fulfill your buckets. I mean, that, that's kind of where I am in life. It's, it's about making sure you're learning about things, whether it's in or outside of medicine to create a fulfilled life. And I think being a student, medical student, resident, and going into practice, again, you're constantly learning a huge amount of information. And then what happened to me was I suddenly had more time and I had more mindset to just think and, and, and okay, what's next? At least that's how, you know, my body and my mind worked. Um, and I, no, one, no one told me this before. So that, that's what I would give a heads up to. Speaking of like learning or, or learning about other things, maybe hobbies were, did you have hobbies before that you lost along the way that you got back into, or you just kind of jumped into something else? Um, I've been the type of person who, who's, you know, delved in a lot of different things. And so I, one thing, you know, when I was in medical school, and this, which shows the maturity level of me is when I was in pathology lab, the first year, me and a buddy who is a musician started uh, planning an 80s party. Like we were talking about this during the pathology class. This is my <laughs> level of maturity and focus. And so I started, uh, we, we started singing old 80s songs and I started singing Eddie Murphy's My Girl Wants to Party All the Time, which is still one of my ultimate favorite songs. <laughs> and he goes, dude, you have a voice. Like w- you should sing that. And I go, I go, come on, man. I go, wait, what do you mean? <laughs> and then we end up going to his house after that pathology class. He ends playing his guitar. He plays piano. He played everything. And we started singing. And we created a band called O-Face from Office Space, um, if, if anyone's ever seen it. It's called O-Face. And we had a band for two years at medical school. And so one, it's, I know this is an important piece of medical school for me, but that's what got me through working out and thinking about singing on stage, which I've never done before. So, so that I just kind of did random stuff. So uh, physical fitness, which I continued to do in resident, uh, in private practice, um, had two awesome daughters. So, you know, busy anesthesiologist, medical director, now busy family and still working out. So I didn't have a lot of hobbies. I know that was a long answer. Yeah, no, that's cool. I I like the, the creative outlets, which I'm sure there's going to be another one we'll talk about here too. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, and the other interesting thing I was, I was listening to you talk, I haven't really thought about this much is, is on the physician journey, there's all these external drivers, right? 
Oh, you have to study so you can get into medical school and you have all this external X stuff. Whereas you have to take all these tests. Oh, you're now you're in your, your clinical years. Now it's external, external, external. And there is that transition, which I don't think we've ever talked about before that once you're now out, like once you've passed your boards, yeah, there is nothing really external anymore other than maintaining licensure. And so that transition point, like you kind of said, um, I would, I would definitely say for myself, it was, it was, it was a challenging kind of thing when you all of a sudden you're like free range. I don't know what you call yeah. that. It's like, you're just like cut loose and there's no a structure <laughs> might happen after I left the military because you know, that was another external thing that occurred. Um, but did you didn't really have, it doesn't sound like you struggled with that at all because you had already been doing kind of maintaining these interests through the whole path. Is that true? I think there was always any pockets of free time. I filled it up with random stuff. Mm -hmm. So it worked out okay for me. And that's where, again, I would tell someone coming into the field, you know, you might necessarily be okay with open gaps. um, But for me, I felt a gap. And so what do I fill it up with? And, you know, by the time I was, you know, middle, maybe several years into uh, practicing in my private practice, I started learning about real estate investing and angel investing and and some other things. And, you know, so, so I kept myself busy. And if my wife was here, who's also a practicing physician, she'll go on on a whole list of things that Naveen's tried to do and Naveen keeps (laughs) busy and does this. So I, I, you know, I know that about myself. Awesome. You're, you're a mover and a shaker. It seems like I'm a mover and a shaker. That's right. (laughs) Well, I, I think this is a good place to transition. Um, because this, this, these outside interests that you had and uh, will lead to phase two of Dr. Goyal's story here. So Naveen, if, if to kind of wrap this episode up, is there anything that you want to leave the listener with either a new physician or someone who's either starting medical school about just, just your journey in, in, in general and what if you had to give, like Melissa said, one sentence here, one piece of advice for someone listening at this point, what would you say to them? I would say that you have to be committed to the field of medicine to go through it and be fulfilled by it. But even if some things don't work out on the outside factors of medicine culturally or, or burnout or stress or career friction, like in many professions, it is not a dead end. There are a lot of things you can do with a foundation of what you're building for yourself and what you're learning. Awesome. Fantastic. Um, I guess uh, we'll probably dive into how people can maybe reach out to you for some of the things we'll talk about in the second episode, but is there just a general website or place to connect with you that you'd like to direct people? Yeah. So I am on LinkedIn. I'm very active on LinkedIn. I share a lot of uh, my journey and entrepreneurship and investing. Um, So I post a lot there and they can reach me through there. And I also have a website that's physicianunderdog.com, which is my personal website and uh, my book. So Awesome. Well, we'll put those in the show notes. And um, thank you again for joining us. And for those, any last minute uh, comments, Kevin, before I'm I take good. us out? Okay. Well, thank you for joining us on The Change Physician. I am Melissa Cady, The Challenge Doctor, with my co-host, Dr. Kevin Kakaro. And if you don't know what The Change Physician is all about, you can go to thechangephysician.com and check out our stories. And if you'd like to become part of the community, whether you're a physician or a physician ally, we'd love to see you there. And of course, you can hit us up on all the podcast uh, venues, or you can check us out on Instagram or Facebook and our Facebook Lives on Saturday or Sundays, usually. And we look forward to seeing you in the next episode. Take care. Stay well, folks.